bit about monkeypox genomes and genetic epidemiology, what we know from uh, the genomes that are already out there, and what are the insights that we have gained, and of course, what are the surprises that we have come across. Now, before I start my talk, it is uh, it is almost mandatory to also state that all that we do today in microbiology is indebted to uh, this person, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, who was uh, by hobby a scientist and by profession a merchant and a municipal official. Now, his claim to fame and uh, his instrument that actually changed the world is depicted in here. It's a handheld device which he used to observe the world around him. And using this device, he could observe organisms which were not observable by the naked eye. And this is what today we call as the microscope. Now, of course, microscopy and, uh, and the techniques of doing microscopy has evolved uh, quite significantly over these years. And that has been and is still one of the mainstays of microbiology. And while this changes happened in the field of microbiology, there was also a different uh, sort of change happening around the world, and that was in the field of genomics. And most of this uh, advancements happened with the release of the human genome, uh, as we know uh, in, in mid-20s. And further advancements in technologies, what we today call as next generation sequencing technologies, enabled sequencing of thousands, if not millions of genomes today, uh, both human as well as other organisms. And the capability that you can sequence organisms with modest infrastructure. So today you don't need multiple countries to put together $3 billion to sequence a human genome. Uh, a modest sized lab with modest infrastructure today could sequence a whole or part of human genome. And that has long and far reaching changes in the science and uh, in, in, in the medicine that we practice. Now, why should I bring this genomics in here is because compared to the traditional approaches of doing microbiology, the last half a decade to a decade has also seen genomics slowly wriggling its way into microbiology to today become one of the mainstays in microbiology. Now, to convince this point, what I would say is, uh, for example, if you would take an outbreak 25 or 30 years ago, typically the, the samples would be processed, the virus would be isolated, and the virus would be observed under what you see here, an electron microscope. And then the characteristic of the, the virus would be observed and communicated. And typically, this would take weeks, if not months, and sometimes even years before the identity of the organism is established. But today, we don't do all this. We actually take samples, process them, and sequence them. And today, we can actually identify the organism uh, in less than 24 hours. And it is not just you can identify the organism, but you could also detect and characterize the genome of the organism, what kind of organism is that, and uh, uh, how is it related to other organisms that we know today, uh, in terms of not just the genome, but also in terms of how to correlate the genome to the phenotype. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that today we have a much better microscope, and I tend to call it a genoscope, where you can use genomic material and genome sequencing to understand the pathogen much, much more efficiently, much, much more fast, and much, much more cost effective. And of course, COVID has seen and has shown us how genomics could be employed at scale, or just for diagnosis, but also for genomic characterization of organisms and also for genetic epidemiology. Now comes the real question, why would people use genomics for genetic epidemiology? What are the basic principles of using genomics for genetic epidemiology? Now, as we all know, every organism evolved and its evolution is mediated 
by accumulation of genetic changes, uh, what we call as mutations. Uh, a, a much broader term to state that for the genetic variations because mutations have its own connotations. Now, the only difference between them is the rate of mutation or rate of accumulating such changes. Now, multiple studies have previously estimated that multiple different kinds of viruses, depending upon what genetic material they have, would have a differential rate of accumulating genetic changes. Single standard RNAs have a much higher rate of accumulating changes compared to double standard. DNA viruses. And of course, you could, you could put this across in a plot and classify different organisms on whether they are highly mutating or slowly mutating. Now, how is this mutations important? Uh, mutations are important because they always occur in the context of previously discovered, previously existing mutations. So if I just take six mutations and sort of space them across in time for a particular organism, you would see that a mutation, say for example, one, two, uh, the, the second mutation occurs in the context of the first mutation. The third mutation could be, for example, making it one, two, three, or one, two, four, so and so forth. Okay. Now, as you, as you would imagine, accumulation of mutations is therefore a factor of time because each organism has a nearly constant rate of accumulating such changes. And therefore, if you would sample such organisms over a period of time, you would be able to identify chains of events uh, or chains of mutations that would happen in the context of the existing mutations. And of course, uh, if it's a random process, you would find all the uh, all the mutations in equal proportions, but that is not the uh, We see some events uh, or some genetic changes occurring disproportionately larger than others, and that is called emergence events. And emergence events, of course, as we know today, can happen because of multiple kinds of problems. Uh, one of it, it could be, for example, a super spreader event, where, for example, an individual infected in this particular case, one, two, four, could transmit to a large number of individuals. And over a period of time, you would find a large and disproportionate number of one, two, fours compared to the other uh, events. It could also happen that 124 could have a genetic advantage, uh, either by its virtue of making it transmissible or by virtue of infecting people who have previously been infected or what we call as immune escape. And therefore, over time, you would find a larger proportion. So emergence events is something that is interesting because these offer very interesting clues into uh, uh, both the human factors as well as the viral factors uh, in terms of both evolution as well as in terms of transmission events. So briefly, uh, you could assume that if you put multiple genomes of a particular organism, organism, you would find organisms typically clustering together by shared genetic events or shared genetic changes. And when they cluster together because they share commonalities between them, we call them as a lineage or in other words, a clade. And therefore, you could cluster them over time and you could identify multiple genetic lineages. Just to just an example to show that here I sort of described two different genetic lineages of clades because they have genetic mutations which are exclusively shared between members of that particular cluster. Now, as I said, there is a constant rate of mutation. And second, there are genetic changes which happen and such genetic changes typically tend to cluster. And putting these two information, you could also derive uh, another important information on what is the time of origin of the common ancestor. Now, in many times, this common ancestor is a virtual virus. Uh, in, in many cases, you may not be able to sequence them, but you will be able to reconstruct the ancestor given a set of genetic mutations, not just reconstruct the virus, but also be able to state uh, fairly accurately at what point in time did this event emerge or did this virus emerge. And this is really important because this gives very interesting clues into how did this virus spread uh, across time, how did it originate and how did it diverge from its predecessor and come into a particular location and particular point in time. And this is what we call as the time to most re recent common ancestor or TMRC. Now, having said this, these are the two important principles that we need to keep in mind while looking at genomes. Can we understand how the virus is evolving? Can we understand the genomic characteristics by looking at the changes? 
and more importantly, can we glean important findings about the clusters of genomes happen because they tend to be linked together either uh, epidemiologically or by viral evolution. And fourth, the most important thing, can we sort of look back in time and sort of reconstruct ancestors, not just in, in terms of the genome sequence, but also in time of origin of the particular ancestor. Now, that brings me back to the context today. It's about monkeypox. Now, as we know today, the outbreak was reported on 18th May in Madrid, and, uh, and uh, almost all those initial cases could be traced to a sauna or a spa, which was in Madrid. And of course, over weeks, the, the, the virus has spread now encompassing close to around 25,000 cases in over 80 countries. And just recently, on June 23rd, WHO declared this multinational outbreak as a public health emergency of international concern. Now, it is not to state that this is the first time monkeypox has emerged. Monkeypox has been emerging in many countries in Africa, and at least in some countries, it's considered to be endemic. But this is the first time that such a large spread across multiple countries, around 80 countries, have happened in a close period of time, which sort of suggests that there is a sustained human to human transmission that is happening outside countries where it is considered to be endemic or prevalent. <clears throat> now, consequent to the identification of cases of monkeypox across the world, there have also been genome sequences of monkeypox available. And of course, genome sequences of monkeypox have been available for quite some time out of outbreaks in Africa, as well as from travelers who have traveled to many of these countries and brought monkeypox into new territories, for example, the United States of America uh, and, and elsewhere, where they could actually look at the genome sequences and more importantly, make these genome sequences available in public domain so that researchers can actually use the sequences to glean very useful insights about the virus. Now, briefly speaking, monkeypox uh, is a quite large virus. It has around 200 base pairs, 200,000 base pairs. It's a DNA virus. It has around 190 odd genes. And the very peculiar thing being that it has two repeat regions on two ends of the genome, which we call as the ITRs. Now, in terms of the mutation spectrum, what is known, and not just for monkeypox, but orthopox viruses in general, uh, it has a modest mutation rate, assumed to be around one to two substitutions per genome per year. And uh, uh, unique sets of mutations, like, for example, recombination events have been reported uh, between organisms of the same kind and also non homogeneous recombination uh, taking in foreign genes into the box uh, genomes. And more importantly, uh, a particular cytoplasmic enzyme, Apobec3, and to be specific, Apobec3A, has been implicated in the cytoplasmic DNA editing of monkeypox virus, which sort of gives it an additional advantage in terms of uh, mutation rates in human dependent transmission. <clears throat> now, of course, uh, this is from one of the earliest papers on monkeypox genomes, uh, which has looked at a large number of monkeypox genomes and sort of characterized a very unique cluster which, of, of genomes, which has emerged from the outbreak in 2022. And as I suggested before, this cluster of genomes and the mutations also suggest the role of ABOBEC 3A uh, in, in, in the mutations because there was a GA2AA and a TC2TT sort of bias in the mutations. <laughs> and of course, this cluster uh, was associated with close to around 50 nucleotide changes, a quite significant jump. Uh, compared to the genomes in the previous years in 2018 and 2019, uh, sort of suggesting there's been a sort of accelerated evolution happening uh, in, in, in the period between them. Of course, we don't know much about what this accelerated evolution would, uh, would mean, but we have only some clues about what could have happened in here. And to actually make this cluster a bit more clear, so what you see here is the B1 cluster or B.1 cluster, which is associated with this particular outbreak in 2022. And as you see here, almost uh, every single virus from this particular cluster seems to be very close together and minimally divergent from each other in this particular cluster. And this is what is called as polytome. 
Now, polytomy is sort of suggestive of an outbreak event, typically a super spreader event, because you could you could uh, enable a particular virus to be spreading to a large number of people, and each of these individuals would have a very similar virus compared to what was uh, transmitted uh, to the person out there. And they also observed uh, a different cluster A.2. I will come to that a, a bit from here. Uh, but they largely belong to what we today call as the clade three of monkeypox. Uh, they, of course, uh, are the two clades, clade one and clade two of monkeypox, which has very specific uh, geographical uh, and epidemiological boundaries. I'll not delve deeper into it, but just to state that most of the genomes out of this outbreak came from this large cluster called B.1. And when you come back to India and very specifically to Kerala, it has the largest number of monkeypox cases. Uh, the first case was detected on 15 July 2022. Dr. Aravind, who is going to speak after me, is going to give a much detailed overview about the monkeypox outbreak in the state. Um, as of today, there are five cases of monkeypox and one case uh, of death reported. And all of these cases have a history of travel to one of the Middle Eastern countries. Now, of course, thanks to researchers from the National Institute of Virology, uh, two genome sequences of these five cases have now been deposited in public domain. And very interestingly, if you cluster those genomes, they do fall into a very distinct cluster, which I earlier mentioned as the A.2 and not the B.1, which forms the larger cluster, which is linked to the European event. Now, this is the most important thing in genomics and in, in terms that looking at a particular genome you could you could understand a lot about what really would have happened to uh, in terms of the transmission event in terms of the origin of the outbreak so and so forth now this was very surprising to uh, pretty much everybody because it is widely thought that the monkeypox outbreak and the cases that we see across the world today is largely from an outbreak which originated in spain but uh, as and and also suggestive of uh, what the genomes say from uh, many cases sequenced from this outbreak. Now, it's really surprising why these two samples from India would cluster differently and distinctly different from the B1 cluster into a very distinct cluster of A2. And today for this small cluster of A2, it's a very, very small cluster compared to around, uh, to just give you numbers, around 750, 000, uh, 750 genomes of monkeypox have been deposited today in fungicide. And out of this 750, we have close to around nine genomes from six uniclinical samples, which cluster into this small distinct cluster. And all these samples have come from either the United States of America, uh, Thailand, much recently in 2022, and from India. And of course, you could, you could look at the genomes. The earliest genomes were from June 2021. They sort of coincides with the time to most recent common ancestor. Uh, and that sort of suggests that we are very close to uh, having found the origin of that particular uh, uh, outbreak. And as, as I suggested, these samples have come from very distinctly different geographies. They're not all from America. Uh, there are some cases from America, three, three genomes from America, uh, two genomes from India, and the rest from Thailand. Now, there are multiple different geographies that comes to, and a very old time to... Uh, uh, origin that sort of suggests that there's been a low level of human to human transmission that has been spanning almost over a year. And this has remained cryptic and then detected. And probably because of the heightened surveillance and heightened detection and awareness, more importantly, today they are being picked up across different geographies. Now, of course, uh, this cluster is defined by around 16 uh, unique genetic. Um, mutations or genetic changes, uh, which are distinctly different uh, and unique to this particular cluster compared to the other clusters out there. Some of them uh, are, of course, non-synonymous. A significant large majority of them are non-synonymous, but also there are other kinds of deletions, uh, including a three amino acid deletion, which occurs in this particular cluster of genes. <coughs> and when we look at the substitution events and the mutation rates, uh, the lineage, uh, A2 lineage, seem to have a much lower substitution rate, uh, around 10 substitutions per year, compared to the B1 lineage of around 22 substitutions per year. But of course, you need to keep this with uh, a lot of caveats. The first and the most important thing is that the B1 
since it is a very large outbreak, uh, it could enable parallel evolution of the virus to happen and for uh, a, a bit artificially high rate of genetic mutations than what is anticipated. Uh, and more importantly, the number of genomes in the A2 cluster is extremely low. Uh, we have only, I said, around nine genomes, which is too low to make very conclusive estimates about the mutation rates. As you see here, a wide range uh, in, in terms of the confidence intervals. But more importantly, as I stated before, orthopox viruses typically have a mutation rate of one to two per genome per year. And this is almost uh, uh, 5x to 10x different uh, from what we know about orthopox mutation. So in other words, the percent monkeypox isolates seem to have a much higher genetic mutation rate consistent with observation that they are human to human transmission, which is sustained over a long period of time. So in summary, we have uh, a distinct cluster of genomes from three different countries. Uh, the earliest genome was from Ju uh, July in 2021, which sort of suggests that this virus has been spreading, albeit at the lower level across multiple geographies. The distinct, this cluster is distinctly different from the other B1 cluster, and it has 16 unique genetic mutations. And much more importantly, almost all the cases of A2 lineage are associated with travel either to the Middle East, the United Arab Emirates, or Nigeria, as, as we know about the travel information of these cases. I think I'll stop there and probably take questions. But before that, let me acknowledge a lot of people who made this possible. Uh, most of the analysis that I talked about today was done by uh, Barney Jolly, who has been a graduate student. Uh, and uh, this is all possible with genomic data available in public domain. Uh, thanks to researchers from the CDC in the USA, National Institute of Virology in Pune, who deposited the Indian genomes, and the Thailand Red Cross, who have enabled the Thailand genomes made available in public domain. And of course, many more genomes which form part of the analysis, uh, which are deposited by researchers from multiple different countries in the public domain databases, GSAID and NCDI. And the funding came from CSIR, and of course, we would be uh, open uh, to partnering with people, organizations, to accelerate genomics and genetic epidemiology, not just of monkeypox, but pretty much emerging infectious diseases in this country. 